beneath vast mountains, across open moorland, and alongside shimmering lochs. Scotland's railways travel a landscape like no other. From coastal towns to historic cities. Trains bring passengers to some of Britain's most iconic landmarks. For the crews on board the trains... If you do get a couple of minutes, it's good just to have a wee look out. For the engineers safeguarding the track... We are under no illusion. You get at the top of this thing, it's scary. And for the volunteers keeping Scotland's steam heritage alive... It's a unique thing. You know, it's not just, you know, press a button and it goes. It's part of the joy of working on the world's most beautiful railway. This time, it's action stations when a landslide threatens the West Highland Line. We're battling with nature. We can't stop these landslides happening, but we can try to better predict when they may happen. Jumping for joy, it's a long way down from the fourth bridge. <laughs> and a treasured steam locomotive bids a fond farewell to Scotland's railway. Number nine is, like myself, it's getting old. And you can go on so long, but you can't go on forever. Waverley Station, Edinburgh. For the past 150 years, Waverley has stood at the heart of this historic city, bridging the gap between Edinburgh's old medieval side and the new town. Each day, 70,000 travellers pass through this station. The next train at Platform 1 will be the 8.30 service to Glasgow Central. And during rush hour, over 250 trains come and go to every corner of the UK. But today, one particular service is turning more than a few heads. The Union of South Africa. Built in 1937, and the only member of the A4 class of streamlined steam locomotives still fully operational. The return of this iconic train back to Waverley has drawn quite a crowd of spectators and passengers lucky enough to have a ticket for today's journey. It's the uh, nostalgia for me of being on a, a steam train again. And you sit there and the smoke sort of wafts behind you. Uh, it takes me back to my childhood. Today, this magnificent machine, known as number nine to steam enthusiasts, will journey north, crossing the fourth bridge, following Scotland's east coastal line to Aberdeen, before winding her way back to Edinburgh shortly after sunset. For the 230 passengers on board, the trip delivers a unique perspective on the passing landscape. I'm going at this pace, which is much slower than going on the usual trains that we travel on. You can take account of the, the countryside and just the, everything. It's just really lovely. Of course, the fourth bridge. I mean, who would argue with coming over the fourth bridge? It's an experience, isn't it? Number nine has been crossing the famous fourth bridge for nearly a century. For much of its life, it ran this line every day and, in 1964, it hauled the last passenger steam train from King's Cross. But today's trip is tinged with sadness, because later this year, Number nine is set to retire and is bidding farewell to the lines and landmarks it's called home for the past 80 years. You only have to look out of the window at the number of people who follow this to realise that this is actually a very special occasion and it's a very special thing to, to be part of. 
But not everyone on board is getting the chance to drink in the views. I've just served porridge, and I'm going to heat up the mushrooms, get ready to serve them. We've got haggis on today. It's usually black fun, but because we're in Scotland, we will have haggis on. It's just fast, quality food, and furious, really. We've been together about 11 years, been uh, Not as a partnership. <laughs> That's how you grill and go out now. Which, they love the eggs like that, just perfect eggs, aren't they, really? <laughs> the service on board today's farewell journey is all part of the experience. But it's a relentless schedule for the hospitality team. Why do we do it? Well, because we get a buzz out of it. It's uh, how trains used to be. So this is probably a labour of love, this job. A labour of love, too, for the proud owner of number nine, 80 year old Fife native John Cameron. The steam men are little fraternity of their own. There's, there's very few of us left now. But what we lack in quantity, we make up for in quality. Is that right, Steve? <laughs> a sheep farmer by trade, John's lifelong passion has always been the railway. As a teenager, he rode the footplate of his local steam trains. But John is no mere passenger of number nine. As chairman of Scott Rail in the 1980s, he earned his spurs as a worthy member of the steam crew fraternity. I did my driver's course, as it were, and got passed out as a driver. I have to tell you, though, most of the, the tracks inspectors who were passing me out were guys that I had appointed as chairman of Scotland. So I was quite confident I would pass. John bought the engine for £4,500 in 1966, when the beloved steam locomotives were being phased out in favour of diesel. This rare footage shows how John kept her running on his sheep farm, offering weekend trips along a two-mile stretch of disused freight track. For over three decades, Number 9 has been running special charters back on the main line. Oh, we have to run to the timetable. And we were booked to stand here for, I think, about 10 minutes to let our following train pass us. The engine talks to you, so you listen and you do what the engine asks you and it will normally perform for you. Steve's being modest. He's a good driver, naturally. And I, I know when, when he's driving number nine, I'm quite relaxed. But it takes more than just a driver to get a steam train going. This is the main man. This is the fireman. You'll have to cut the next bit. The driver's gone for a pee. <laughs> Worst thing could happen is if you don't have enough water. Uh, it's not happy when that happens. I agree with the fireman there. When the water disappears from the bottom of the glass, then you start to worry. In fact, you start to pray. Running out of water is every fireman's nightmare. Pressure in the boiler will build, causing the engine to explode. The next scheduled water stop is not until lunchtime at Aberdeen. Fingers crossed they make it that far. Back at Waverley, the morning rush is over and the crowds of commuters have dispersed. But customer service assistant Maggie is still feeling the heat. It is very warm in the station today. There's, um, there's not a lot of wind. We're constantly looking at our uh, phones now, waiting on an email to come through to allow us to take off our ties. Um, because that's uh, as soon as it reaches the temperature of like 20 degrees. We are currently sitting at 19 degrees. It's there, but just not quite for us to receive that email letting us know that we can take our ties off. Of the 20 platforms here at Waverley, one holds a unique place in Maggie's affections. Platform 19, very special uh, moment for me. Uh, it's where I actually met my other half. I was actually checking tickets on this platform and I mistook him for 
another passenger. So I was totally in the zone, asking for her to check the tickets. And along came this gentleman and later discovered when I looked up that he was actually the conductor for the train that was departing. Over 700 conductors currently work on ScotRail services. But there's a lot more to the job than checking tickets. Trainee conductor Melanie has just departed Waverley with her instructor, Rebecca. So you get given this every morning, and this is your, your duty for the day. Right, so next stop is S Bank, and we are departing at 9.43. I think we're running about a minute late already. It's no signal. S Bank, we're going to be on the left side and there's no signal. No signal. No signal, right, perfect. <laughs> Conductor training takes up to six months. As well as an encyclopedic knowledge of the network, conductors must be well versed in safety procedures. So once the train stops, activate, put the doors open. Step off. So what I'm doing now is I'm just checking that everybody's um, alighted from the train and joined the train care, you know, safely, carefully. I'm not going to trap anybody in the door. There's no signal, so I don't need to worry about that. Blow my whistle to let everybody know we're about to dispatch. <whistles> we're ready to go. Jump back on, close this door. I'm going to let the driver know that we're ready to go. Rebecca and Melanie are making the 55-minute journey south from Waverley to Tweed Bank, better known as the Borders Railway. First opened in 1849, the line fell victim to the beaching cuts and was closed in 1969. But following a long and determined campaign, it reopened in 2015 at a cost of nearly 300 million pounds, becoming the UK's longest new railway to be built in over a hundred years. I like being out and about and meeting people. In previous jobs, I never really got to speak to many people and interact, so this is why I wanted to come and do work for ScotRail and, and interact more with people. At Tweed Bank, it's all changed before the return journey to Waverley. Make sure that everything's clear. <whistles> Which means it's Melanie's moment in the spotlight. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard the 1029 service to Edinburgh Waverley to arrive in Edinburgh at 1024. Could all passengers please take a few minutes off their time to read over the safety notices that are located throughout this train? Once again, this is the 1029 service to Edinburgh Waverley. Next stop, Gala Shields. Do I know what your only thing was that you must have put? What do I? You said you were getting to be really at 10 29, but it's not 10 24, but it's 11 24. <laughs> but as of that, another well, week. to be fair, you know, that was only six minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see you talk, don't look at me. <laughs> she makes me like not look at her, and if I look at her, she's like, I made a mistake, that's your fault. <laughs> you looked at me. I've still got all my notes for my announcements just because I'm not really confident in doing it. I've got, I put my telephone voice on for it, so. <laughs> Even with all the stresses of her training, there's still time to enjoy one of the perks of the job. It's nice to get out and, and see a bit of scenery, and I must admit, I really do quite like the Tweed Bank line. It's absolutely lovely, and just, if you do get a couple of minutes, which is not all the time, it's good just to have a wee look out and, have, and see all the lambs, especially at this time of year, and stuff it is, it's lovely. Melanie's training is coming to an end. Signal, new creek hall, signal. Brooks. In a week, She'll be examined as part of her final assessment. I try and come across as really confident and everything, but inside I'm in knots thinking about it. I do get really, really nervous. Um, so certainly on the day that it all happens and everything, I'll, I'll not be able to eat anything or <laughs> anything. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. The West Highland Line. Regularly voted the most scenic railway journey on the planet. And with good reason. Stretching from Glasgow to Fort William and onto the tiny port of Malig. It 
winds its way through a wild and ancient terrain. But a hidden danger lurks within the rugged splendour of this landscape. It was here, in January 2018, that a huge landslip sent a thousand tonnes of rock and mud tumbling onto the line below. It struck overnight, and the following morning at 7am, an approaching two-car passenger train travelling in near darkness failed to spot the obstruction in time and was derailed. Fortunately, no one on board was hurt. Network rail engineers Tom and Stewart are visiting the site to check on measures designed to prevent further damage. So the boat journey's taken us less than a minute to cross. That allows us to move the number of people that we need on site safely and quickly. It means we don't have to put a uh, road rail vehicle onto the track and it means we don't have to affect uh, the normal timetable of the trains. The 2018 landslip occurred between Glenfinnan and Lacharlet on the West Highland Line. This is the channel that it carved out when it failed, which went all the way down to track level. The small catchment fence was no match for the landslide. That's what the landslide did to the lightweight cat fence. <laughs> so, Tom and his team are installing a new, improved barrier. It will be the largest in Britain and the first of its kind in Scotland. Eleven steel columns, each set into a reinforced concrete block in the hillside, will support an 80-metre-long sheet of industrial-strength wire designed to catch boulders as big as washing machines. These are drilled in to the slope and the anchor's latched around that and that takes any of the force if a landslide were to happen. It's designed to stop the same force as a double-decker bus rolling down that hill before it reaches the track. This line, it was built purely to connect the town of Malay to Fort William. Connecting the two communities is really what railways do and it's a fantastic job to be able to continue that and keep people's connections and transport options going. As part of their investigation, Stewart's team of geotech engineers have studied the conditions that triggered the 2018 event. We had a lot of snow cover, which was followed by a very rapid thaw. So we had negative temperatures and overnight basically went into positive figures. On top of that, we had significant rainfall and ultimately the slope just got too saturated and it failed. Predicting when a landslide will occur is near impossible. But for experts like Stuart, the landscape offers clues as to where the next one may strike. You can see that the, the ground is wet here, following what has been a dry period of weather. Um, so there's obviously, there's, there's groundwater here. And our concern for this, this place in particular is that because the scar is potentially opened up at the back, it allows the water to, to penetrate the surface, uh, create a, what we call a slip plane, and it's that top layer which then can slide, uh, resulting in a landslip. When complete, the barrier will preserve and protect this vulnerable stretch of line. But Stuart's job is far from finished. This is just one slope out of a huge area in Scotland. About 40% of this line has a slope above it, which is in excess of 100 metres. So that presents some challenges. It, 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 it means that that 40% are more likely than other areas of the network to fail and have a landslip such as this. To get a clearer view of the challenge they're facing, Stuart will have to take to the skies. It's lunchtime at Edinburgh Waverley. But for trainee conductor Melanie, food is the last thing on her mind. So today I'm doing a traction assessment on the 170, which is behind us. And also I have my written and oral rules questions today. So this should be, if all going well, my last day in training. Yeah, 
morning. The first part of the test takes place on a scheduled service with paying passengers. How are you feeling about this next one? Nervous. Really, really don't, nervous. Don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. The route they're travelling is along the Fife Circle, a 56-minute journey from Waverley to Glenrothes. Her examiner today, Andrew, spent five years as a conductor before rising the ranks to ScotRail's conductor team manager at Edinburgh Waverley. You need to be a people person. We need to have a, a calm nature, um, but be able to be authoritative uh, just in case you are in any sort of emergency situation or a difficult situation where you need to take, take control. Right, so we're just up down, so we've got North Queen's Bay, so it's the second stop, oh, so if you jump off there, you. OK, <laughs> you're <laughs> absolutely Thank fine. Thank you so much. I suppose when you're out doing an assessment, it's, you're on a, a live train, so you, you never know what you can, you can come up against. Things happen all the time with some a lot more involved than just checking and selling tickets. Good morning. That's lovely, thank you very much. So far, so good. Thank you, cheers. Melanie's reached the end of her outward journey at Glenrothes. Right. Terminating. Yeah. So, so make sure everybody's off. Yeah, no problem. Make sure so yep. This is the 11.9 from Kirkcaldy to Edinburgh, Waverley, and the next stop is Kinghorn. Thank you. Good. <sighs> telephone voice, see? Good telephone voice for that one. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, well done. Good, clear announcement. Right. Doing an announcement like that will become second nature once you've been doing the job for a couple of weeks. It's gone well, and I'm, I'm getting there. I was awake really early this morning thinking about all the different things that I need to remember. Hopefully, everything goes all well today. Okay, good night's sleep tonight. <laughs> Melanie's coping well under the pressure of her final assessment, and there's some welcome respite as the train crosses a familiar landmark. We're never tired of coming across the bridges, and especially the day like this. We've picked an absolute perfect day, and it's lovely. One of my favourite things as a conductor is always coming and coming across the fourth bridge. Always like to get you've got your tickets done, you can have a look. But as the train pulls into Waverley, attention turns to the final part of our assessment, the written exam. Right, ready? Ready, let's do this. <laughs> the paper features 200 questions on the railway rules. Fortunately, for the sake of Melanie's nerves, Andrew can deliver the results almost immediately. Well done, you've, that's you, you've passed your, your Railway Rules exam. You'll be a fully-fledged conductor. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> I'm really pleased. Thank well you. done. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> The 80-year-old Gresley A4 locomotive, Union of South Africa, known to her fans as number nine, is halfway through a farewell tour of the UK. Having departed Edinburgh at 9.15 this morning, she's winding her way 130 miles north and is due into Aberdeen shortly after 1pm. For owner John Cameron, number nine's farewell tour is bittersweet. Although a farmer by trade, he's dedicated a lifetime to his first love of steam. Come here. Come here. Oh, good. He's even built his own signal box at his home in Fife. It was, I suppose, every young person's dream was to experience you know, railways and steam locomotives. Even in those early days, I decided that sometime I was going to have a steam locomotive. When she first entered service, number nine bore a plaque featuring a golden springbok. But by the time John purchased her in 1966, the plaque had mysteriously disappeared. At the time when I asked about it, uh, nobody knew where it was. And then 20 years later, uh, it, it appeared at one of the Railway Anna auctions. 
I think perhaps uh, other members that were present at the auction recognised the old white hair. So uh, there was no bidding against me. And the auctioneer proudly announced that um, the Springbok plaque was going back to where it belonged. And I reminded them that the price I just paid for this was about three quarters of what I paid for the locomotive in the first place. Since restoring number nine to her former glory, John and his magnificent machine have been invited to transport many distinguished guests. Maybe the highlight of these special occasions it was the reopening of the Borders Railway as far as Tweed Bank. And of course our, our guest, our guest for the day was Her Majesty the Queen. And the Royal Train was required to be taken from Edinburgh down to Tweed Bank. And number nine was of course the locomotive that was appointed to haul it. I've now owned number nine longer than um, British Rail have. So there you go. Perhaps that shows my age, mind you. It's amazing. You know, there's been school classes out, and people in fields, people in towns, all waving and happy to see it, you know, and you just feel you're part of that. I'm waving back, because I'm so happy. <laughs> Having arrived in Aberdeen, Union of South Africa has drunk her way through 5,000 gallons of water and is running on empty. It's like a giant kettle, a steam locomotive, and it goes through an awful lot of water in the process because you're constantly losing it as steam up the chimney. In their heyday, the A4s could survive the entire 408-mile journey from London to Edinburgh without the need for a pit stop, a feat that's no longer possible. The trouble nowadays is because locomotives don't do big, long stop runs, they're stopping and starting all the time, and you go through oil, water and coal quite quickly because of all the stopping. The crew are volunteers, united by a shared passion for steam and a desire to preserve Britain's engineering history. It's exciting. It's heritage, which we all love as well. It takes us all over the country, and we love each other's company as well. And we don't get paid a penny. <laughs> Number nine's not just here to take on water and coal. Before heading back to Edinburgh, she needs to be turned. But a 167 tonne steam locomotive can't exactly do a three point turn. The loco's coupled off, it's going down the far away line there onto the table. They'll turn it, and by that time, we'll be facing the right direction. An eager crowd has gathered to watch this historic moment. But the turntable being used has never turned a loco as big and as heavy as an A4 before. Only time will tell if it's up to the job. Heading out of Edinburgh Waverley, on the line north to Aberdeen, you'll cross one of the most staggering engineering achievements of the 19th century, the Fourth Bridge. Nearly two and a half kilometres from end to end and made from 53,000 tonnes of steel, it took seven years to complete. A true emblem of Scotland and UNESCO World Heritage Site, its graceful image has been printed on everything from souvenir tea towels to £20 notes. But it's her towering height that's brought people flocking to the bridge today. I'm afraid we probably take the bridge a bit for granted. It's a beautiful piece of engineering. I think the word is iconic. Very iconic. Yeah. I think so. Hundreds of daring fundraisers have gathered for a rare chance to abseil this national landmark. <laughs> Among them, Amy and Rogan from Aberlour Children's Charity. I'm quite scared. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, looking at it now, I think we've been quite calm and collected up until now, but yeah, it's uh, quite a height and we've seen the trains go over and yeah, so it'll be a challenge. 
once you're standing underneath it, it's a lot bigger than <laughs> you see on the telly. <laughs> But um, I'm really looking forward to doing it as well and, you know, raising money for our charity is spurring us on. Over 1,100 fundraisers abseil from the bridge every year to raise money for Scottish charities. Descending and eye-watering 165 feet, from the steel platform Hello. to the soft sandy beach below. Is someone in the mic? Yeah, that's what I'm telling myself. Yep. I'll be telling myself that as I'm stepping on. <laughs> I've been on top of the road bridge before, been on top of the rail bridge, but I've not actually abseiled off it, so it'll be the first for me. <laughs> for one person abseiling today, scaling the 300 plus steps to the top will be a challenge in itself. <laughs> Debbie Matthew is raising money for Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland. I had a stroke three years ago, so this is hugely special for me. This is my third year anniversary challenge. Um, I've still got no feeling in my foot, so the first challenge is the stairs, and then the abseil itself, so it's huge for me today. Um, chest, heart and stroke have been amazing, and I want to give them something back. Um, so, yeah, a bit emotional now. Rooting for Debbie, her husband Johnny, and their son, Finlay. She'd be quite nervous past maybe a week, week and a half. I think they're really pleased that they're really proud of me, what I'm doing. Um, I don't think they can quite believe it either yet. And I've pledged to raise a thousand pounds and I've smashed it. So, um... Once the harnesses... Oh, that's pretty good. ..and helmets are on... The colour suit. Oh, thanks. It's showtime. Let's do this. OK, guys, let's go. From a slightly giddy 165 feet above the fourth, wow. the views are breathtaking. Oh, wow, look, and the view up here is amazing. Meanwhile, Debbie's nearly conquered her first hurdle of the day. I'm almost at the top, so that's huge for me. I'm really excited, and this has been a huge challenge for me, and this was my first thing I wanted to do. So, and I've just about done it. <laughs> the faster it goes, the faster you go. You cannot go yeah. too fast. Ready, Amy? Yeah. Joy. Thank you so much. 200 trains thunder across this bridge every 24 hours. And there's no let up in the schedule today. Amazing. The adrenaline rush is just like. Woo! Yeah! Each year, the Absailers raise more than £400,000 for charity. That's quite high, eh? <laughs> when you look down. <laughs> it's Debbie's turn to take the plunge. You can do it, Debbie. Over four and a half thousand men, seven years to build this bridge, a landmark that stood firm since 1890. Debbie's managed to conquer it in just 90 seconds. When I was up there, actually about to, to jump off, um, a train did go over. Um, it was a bit rattly. You can hear it was really, really loud, actually. Um, and the ropes start to move, and you're starting to jiggle about. So yeah, that's a bit scary. Looking up and seeing the train, and there we go, that one now. I just can't imagine coming off there myself, you know, it's just so proud of her, you know. It's amazing. Like, I probably wouldn't do it, um, but, yeah, I'm very proud of her.
from busy cities to rural communities. 2,300 trains crisscross Scotland every day. Connecting passengers to 359 stations around the country. They travel a network of some 2,800 kilometres, carving a path through spectacular but often hostile environments. At Cumbernauld Airport, network rail engineer Stuart Jameson is getting ready to take to the skies with aerial cameraman Sean Leahy. Once we finish there, back into Oban, refuel, come back to Cumbernauld. I actually get to fly in the what I consider the most beautiful part of the British Isles, um, the West Highland Line. It should be on everybody's bucket list to come and see. Don't go on a cruise, don't do anything like that. Come and see the railways of Scotland because you'll never ever forget it. It is one of the greatest things you'll ever do. But the West Highland Line is under constant threat from the very landscape upon which it sits. Stuart is part of Network Rail's geotech team. It's a nice day. Responsible for detecting potential landslides, like the incident at Loch Yilt, which derailed a train in 2018. So the mission today is to go out and use the, the helicopter and the aerial imagery we can capture today uh, to get a really good perspective of the big natural hillsides. A three-hour journey by car, the helicopter flight to Loch Yilt will take just 20 minutes. And the views aren't bad either. It doesn't take long head north from Helmsford before you start getting into the mountains. Well, I do have to pinch myself every now and again to remind myself I'm actually being paid to do this because I just have to look out the window ahead of me. This is raw nature at its very best. It is just a beautiful part of the world. Built in the final years of the 19th century, the Malig Line is a triumph of Victorian engineering. The 40-mile stretch features 11 tunnels bored through solid bedrock, plus six spectacular concrete viaducts, including the iconic curving 1,200-foot span at Glenfinnan. That is the Jacobite steam train going across the Glenfinnan viaduct, or the Harry Potter Bridge, uh, as it's known. It is a, a majestic sight. Um, it really does help to Renew the nostalgia and the romance of the railways. A steam train running through this scenery is, is probably the epitome of, of rail travel. So we're heading up to Loch Eel on the Valley Line. We're gonna get some great aerial uh, overview of the site to see exactly what's happened. This was the, the main landslip event in 2018, which caused the derailment. What we're looking at now is the um, prevention works that's going on, so the concrete supports are in. But what we can do is we can look right out, and look right up the mountain to where the problems are. We can see where the scarring is at the top. We see the scarring on the other side. And we can see if there's any fault lines beginning to appear. The benefit of the aerial survey is we can just check in on these sites. We know they failed in the past. We're looking for any deterioration around about the scarring and we're looking for any new scars. Fortunately, today's survey has revealed no immediate threats to the line. But for Stuart and his team, the challenge of safeguarding Scotland's railways continues. The thing you need to realise here, we're battling with nature. We can't stop these landslips happening, but we can try to better predict when they may happen and uh, impose control measures to stop the trains colliding with the debris. Mm -hmm. 
on the Malik stretch of the West Highland Line at the shores of Loch Hield. It's a big day for project manager Tom. Network Rail geotech engineers Alistair and Stewart have come to check on Tom's 80 metre long landslide barrier that's been bolted to the hillside. Stuart and Alistair are having a look because ultimately it's their asset that they're going to take on in the future. The good news for Tom is that in the two weeks since his last visit, progress has been swift. All 11 posts have been erected and 80% of the mesh is up. It is what we hoped for. It might look visually obtrusive up close, but in the context of the, of the environment, when you get a little bit further away, it blends in quite nicely. The detail it looks fantastic. The guys have done a really good job. It's the only barrier of its kind in Scotland, and Tom's confident it'll handle whatever Mother Nature throws at it in the future. You see these, these rings? They're essentially the suspension. So when a landslip happens, that barrier flexes out flexes back again and, and catches it much like the suspension in your car and those rings allow the wire to set essentially extend out and then the ring brings it back. For those who've been involved in its construction, this week sees the culmination of more than 18 months hard work. It's really nice to see something like this be constructed. You get a bit of a buzz from working on emergency response jobs and this part of the network is the most beautiful. It's, it's my favourite part. I was really excited to work on the Malay line and it's just so picturesque, I love it. What we're doing here is safety critical. Uh, we are ensuring the safe passage of trains through these beautiful landscapes and we're very happy with the way it's turned out. The 167-tonne steam locomotive Union of South Africa is in Aberdeen, about to be rotated 180 degrees so she can make one final return journey to Edinburgh. A locomotive can go forwards or backwards, and there's no issues mechanically with that. But for safety's re safety reasons, they prefer to have the funnel at the front and the driver looking forwards. And if you look at the tender, you'll see why, because the back of the tender is often piled up with coal. So actual visibility going backwards, tender first, is very limited. The Ferry Hill turntable, first built in 1906, has only recently reopened, having been refurbished at a cost of almost £100,000. There we go. It was originally powered by a vacuum motor, but the motor hasn't yet been fixed. So today they've replaced horsepower with manpower. With this icon of steam set to retire from service, it's a site owner John Cameron is unlikely to witness again. Going well, eh? Considering it's manpowered. Backed a couple on the coach and then uh, back to reconnect with the train. It's five o'clock. And having reconnected with its 10 carriages and 230 passengers, number nine is winding its way back to Edinburgh Waverley. And dinner is served. It's Philip steak with Yorkshire pudding with a nice rich uh, ham fried gravy. That's the gravy trend product. <laughs> It's uh, been a long day, but it's been uh, really very enjoyable. All the passengers and guests are happy, aren't they? So, have a day done. As the sun sets, number nine bids a final farewell to the rugged landscapes and quaint villages it served for the best part of a century. I look at it this way, I guess number nine is like myself, it's getting old. And you can go on so long, but you can't go on forever. So we'll go out together.